This week on the show, we have FreeBSD 10.4 release and another EuroBSDCon travel report, as well as the crack attack, which is probably in everyone's ears by now, and you don't want to hear about this anymore, but yeah, it's well worth covering. And there's ZFS and DTrace on NetBSD updates, as well as PFSense 2.4, this week's episode of BSD. Now. BSD Now, episode 218, a crack in the Wi-Fi, recorded for the 1st of November 2018. Hi, I'm your host, Benedict Reuschling. And I'm Alan Jude. Oh, what a wonderful episode we have this week for you. A lot of content, so we should get right into it with the headlines, which uh, the first item has FreeBSD 10.4 releases available. Yes. I guess uh, the other thing we should mention is that we're actually recording this a bit early, so it's, what, October 18th today, uh, mm -hmm. even though you guys won't see this for two weeks. Um, so keep that in mind when we discuss the news. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit so later than usual, yeah. Yes. By the time you see this, some of this will be old news, but it's still useful. <laughs> All right, yeah. 10.4 release in FreeBSD is out. And there's some show notes. Uh, not show notes, well, it's release notes. <laughs> release it's notes. Something yes. similar. <laughs> uh, I think one of the biggest ones is that uh, FreeBSD 10.4 release is the first FreeBSD release uh, to have a fully featured eMMC storage stack. So that's the uh, that erasable multimedia card. Uh, it's uh, a storage medium that a lot of uh, small flash devices use and so on and even cell phones uh, including support for trim uh, different bus speeds so it can support up to HS 400 which is really high speed uh, that it has uh, a number of these different modes uh, as well as um, SDHCI controllers part as the uh, Intel's Apollo Lake chipsets which are used on a lot of uh, different things um, and they have a bunch of information there, and you can even have partitions under eMMC, which is uh, a new feature. Very nice. Uh, they have an interesting fix for uh, the FSCK tool. Um, if you specify the, divis the disk you want to scan via its GPT disk label, um, it can now properly find the super blocks. Um, it was having trouble before, but that's fixed. The ASCNI driver has been uh, Updated to no longer share a single FVU context across multiple sessions uh, and multiple threads, addressing problems when employing uh, AES and I accelerating IPsec. So if you're running a, on uh, the 10 series and you want better IPsec, you can upgrade and get much better speeds. Uh, many drivers backported, including the uh, Intel i219 and 4th uh, and 5th generation devices, which are used on Kaby Lake. Um, it also supports uh, Wake on LAN for the i217, i218, and 219 chips, uh, so that you can set that up. And there's information about that in the notes. Um, it also says use lane core dumps can now trigger events such as generating a human readable crash report via DevD. Although this feature is off by default, but you can set it up and actually get uh, useful information and, and trigger more uh, interesting events using DevD. Uh, I'm looking forward to us expanding that even further. Uh, they also backported uh, the driver for the Mellanox ConnectX4 series of adapters uh, so that you can do Ethernet and InfiniBand at high speed with ConnectX4 devices. And they have the QLX GBE, which is the... I forget which manufacturer that is now. But lots more uh, high-speed network drivers. Uh, as well as updates to the version of SSH, GNOME, XServer, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for those people who don't want to run uh, current for some reason, but still want to benefit uh, uh, from a bunch of these driver updates or some things that are getting backported into the releases, mm -hmm. that's a good way to catch the newest stuff happening. Yeah, uh, so in general... The upgrade from a 10.2 or 10.3 or whatever to 10.4 will be very smooth. It's just a minor update. 
uh, and you won't have to update any packages and any package that worked on 10. anything will work on 10.4. Uh, going to 11 is a little bit more work, although there are quite a few extra features, so you should probably get on 11 at some point, but 10.4 uh, lets you buy a little bit of time there uh, with a much smaller upgrade. Yeah, and this is, path. yeah, right. And it's a certainly going to be the last release of the uh, yes, 10 release? Yes, definitely the last release of the 10 branch because uh, it will be five years old in about a year. And that'll be the end of the branch. Mm -hmm. So here's your notice now. You have about a year to get upgraded to 11. Yeah, try it out on a different system and if everything works, then make the jump either via uh, full compile or FreeBSD update. So yes, tell us about so, the next story we yeah. have here. Next story is from the, another travel uh, notes or travel trip report for our EuroBSDCon Paris 2017. Um, this is over at the NetBSD blog uh, by Leonardo Takari. So he posted his experiences from uh, EuroBSDCon this year. Mm -hmm. And it starts off, let me tell you about my experience at EuroBSDCon 2017 in Paris. Uh, we will see what was presented during NetBSD Developer Summit on Friday, and then we will give a look uh, to all NetBSD and package source presentations given during the conference session on Saturday and Sunday. Of course, a lot of fun was happening at the hallway track, several breaks during the conference, and the dinners uh, they had together with other BSD developers and the community. Uh, he writes also, this is difficult to describe, and I will try to just share some part of that uh, with photographs that we have taken, so there's a bunch of them available on the website. Um, he writes, I can say that uh, it was a really beautiful experience. I had a great time with others, and after coming back home, I miss all of them a lot. Yeah, that's uh, a similar experience many other BSD conference attendees have. Um, so if you have never been in any BSD conference, uh, he strongly suggests that you go to the next one. So please stay tuned via the NetBSD events uh, webpage, I guess. And being there is probably the only way to understand these feelings. Oh yeah, that's that's true. Yeah, there's certain there's a certain thing happening at the conference that you cannot grasp if you have never been at one. Yeah, you just you have to go to one, and then you'll understand, and then you'll have to go to all of them, and then. <laughs> <laughs> then it's yeah. Okay, so it starts with Thursday, uh, the NetBSD Developer Summit they have there. Um, arriving in Paris via a night train from Italy, um, he writes, I literally sleepwalked through Paris, getting lost again and again. And after getting in touch with other developers, they had a dinner together and went sightseeing for a, well, well several beers, um, which went into the next day, the NetBSD Developer Summit. So this was a two-day dev summit. Oh, no, the, the, the first one, the Thursday, was a dinner. So yep. the, the first and only day was the Friday of the NetBSD Dev Summit. That's how yep. it went. Okay, so on Friday morning, we met for the NetBSD Developer Summit, kindly hosted by Arola. So this is a company in France. Mm -hmm. um, it had a um, couple of presentations, and one was uh, NetBSD on Google Compute Engine by Benny Siegert, uh, Scripting DDB with Forth by Valerie Ushakov, uh, News from the Version Control Front. So Jörg Sonnenberger is busy doing um, the conversion uh, to Git for the uh, NetBSD uh, source repository, and he described well, also his to Mercurial. I don't think they've decided on which one they're going to go with. Yeah, right. It's um, or it's used as a kind of a migration tool to jump from one to the next. Um, but this is right. What so I think uh, in both cases they're using Fossil as a gateway to get from CVS to something more modern, whether that be Git or Mercurial. Ah, okay. Uh, so you see that uh, not every BSD problem or not every BSD project is uh, on Git yet, but yeah, there are different approaches. So um, then there was an afternoon discussion and uh, a dinner, of course, and the evening. And after the lunch, he writes, we had several non-scheduled discussions, some time for hacking and uh, some more activities. Uh, then they had a nice dinner together, uh, which was in a restaurant with a very nice waiter who always shouted after every order or after accidentally dropping and crashing dishes. Yeah, that's probably a bit weird, but he liked that attitude. <laughs> and then did some sightseeing and had a beer together. Okay, then Saturday, which was the first day of the conference session and social event. So one other thing I will do uh, that I liked that they did was, in the pictures, labeling who the people were. Uh, which oh, yeah. Which helped a lot with the 
you know, recognizing faces and so on. Yeah, for people who haven't seen these before, but of course, want to know who's doing that, guy it on the that one would take a lot longer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is a bit more difficult, but you could probably get the names for everyone. I think you know uh, most of them, yes. Although yeah. writing it in a way where you could match them up would be difficult. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, without ruining the picture. Just uh, get a series of stickers and put numbers on everybody, and then <laughs> <laughs> numbers yeah. on everybody's forehead, and then you can <laughs> match it up with an index. <laughs> Yeah, so um, these are the sessions listed uh, that were NetBSD talks at the conference, which mm -hmm. wasn't that bad. So it had a good outcome. So EuroBSDCon mm -hmm. always tries to, you know, manage um, or to level out the number of um, talks between the BSD projects. So the first one was a modern replacement for BSD spell. Uh, another one was portable hot plugging, NetBSD's UVM hot plug API development, uh, hardening package source, and reproducible builds on NetBSD. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, the social event uh, on Saturday evening took place on a boat that cruised on the Seine River. It is a very nice and different way to sightsee Paris, eat and enjoy some drinks and socialize and discuss with other developers in the community. Yeah, I saw this reaction from many people that they like this format that you could walk around and don't have the same number of people sitting at your uh, table the whole night. Yes, I would say uh, I definitely didn't get as much to eat and so on, but I definitely spent more time talking to more different people uh which i think is most of the point of a social event mm. um and so social i definitely event. appreciated that yeah okay second day of the conference session was the school of hard knocks part one by Sevan. i went to this one because he was my or still is my mentee and i wanted to see what he does in netbsd land because yeah why not um and i guess there will be a part two in the future so this might be something to look out for um, the LLDB debugger on NetBSD and what's in store for NetBSD 8.0 by Alistair Crooks because, you know, it's good to have an outlook into the future, what's mm -hmm. going to happen. And, of course, then there was a Sunday dinner they did. Uh, he writes, after the conference, we did some sightseeing in Paris, had a dinner together, and then enjoyed some beers. So, his conclusion is, it was a very nice weekend and conference. It's worth to mention that EuroBSDCon 2017 was the biggest BSD conference. More than 300 people attended it. And he would like to thank the entire EuroBSDCon Euro organizing committee, Baptiste, Antoine, uh, Sebastian, uh, jean Ive, and the EuroBSDCon program committee, uh, also listed here in the show notes, and of course the EuroBSDCon foundation for organizing such a wonderful conference. He would also like to thank the speakers for presenting very interesting talks, all developers and community that attended the NetBSD Dev Summit and conference, uh, in particular jean Ive and Jörg, for organizing and moderating the Dev Summit and Arola that kindly hosted us for the NetBSD Dev Summit. And a special thanks also to Abinav uh, and Martin for photographs and locals, uh, jean Ive and Stoned, well, that's the, the nickname, for helping us in uh, not get lost in Paris uh, Roos. Yeah, that's good. Uh, yeah, he writes, thank you. And yeah, this is, I couldn't have written it better. It's a very good conclusion of a very good and successful conference. This week's episode of BSD Now is brought to you by DigitalOcean. Head over to digitalocean.com uh, and get signed up and you can get a BSD VM running in the cloud with SSD back storage and lots of bandwidth and gigabit uplink for as little as $5 a month. Yeah, easy to set up, easy to start, easy to manage. I'm just, I was just checking the uptime of my little VM that I have now and it's doing some quasal things and other uh, stuff that I need a server in the cloud or in the internet for and it has like been 70 days now it's mm -hmm. running and running no problems well, yes it's it's been up and since you booted it <laughs> yeah, yeah no need to reboot and mm -hmm. it's a very nice experience and yeah easy to manage you can I mean the stuff that I do with it is probably not that much but you can add so much stuff to your little digital ocean droplet like block storage or High availability, failover, so... Well, there's this. Uh, some interesting developments actually coming out this week. So, yes, uh, the nice thing is you can start with the $5 one and then upsize it later if you need. Yeah, the more power uh, you need, the more you can add yes, to and it. And when, when you upsize it, if you choose not to grow the disk, then you can also downsize it back later. 
Ah, interesting. So these Which are all another SSDs? reason why you might use the block storage to provide some of the storage so that it's separated and you can resize the machine up and down to get, you know, maybe for a couple hours you would like to reboot it and have a lot more CPUs. And then when you're done, reboot it back. Although you could just spin up a separate one depending on what you're doing. But anyway, uh, but in the news this week, they've just announced they've created a backbone network between the data centers. So before, if you had machines at multiple data centers with DigitalOcean and you wanted them to communicate with each other, that was over the public internet. And that was subject to the fake areas of the internet where you know a route might be bad and the ping high or something like that. But now they have dedicated backbone links directly between their data centers. Uh, so okay. for example, in Europe, uh, you see the, the lines in blue are the ones that are active already. And the ones in black are the ones that are in the process of building. So they'll have a full mesh topology you'll see here. Currently, you can get from London to uh, Amsterdam or to Frankfurt, um, but they're shortly going to have it such that you can get from any data center in Europe to any of the other data centers in Europe directly without Excellent. having to hop through one of the other ones. Yeah. So now, if you have VMs in any two of the data centers in Europe, they can talk to each other directly over a lowest possible latency link. And then uh, they extended that by hooking... Uh, Amsterdam and London back to the New York data centers, which were actually all connected together as well, because they actually have three data centers in New York. And they're building out so that you'll be able to get from the data centers in New York directly to Germany without having to go through Amsterdam or London first. Oh yeah, that's uh, much more direct. And the block storage volumes can be up to 16 terabytes in size, so that's something already. Mm -hmm. You should be able to use those. Yeah, and they've already got uh, three distinct paths to get from New York to this various San Francisco data centers, and they got one more under construction. And then uh, they hope to, at the beginning of next year, uh, also connect Toronto to New York uh, and complete the build of their connection between Singapore and San Francisco and Singapore and Frankfurt. Mm -hmm. uh, and so by the end of Q1 next year, they should have a complete mesh network between all the data centers very cool yeah so if you're running your business or your services whatever you have among multiple regions on the world or among different data centers in the digital ocean cloud then this is a very welcome addition to the already cool yeah, yeah. features they provide um, if you want to do high availability you might need to replicate your database between two data centers and doing that over uh, a consistently fast, uh, consistent latency backbone network instead of the public internet can make a big difference in the reliability of that. Hmm. Yeah, yes. so check out. Head over there, check it out. And uh, remember, use the coupon code FREEBSD now, all one word, lowercase, and you'll get an extra $10 deposited into your account. So, our next story. Yeah. As you, if you probably haven't been already living, heard by the time this yeah. comes out. <laughs> if you haven't been living on the rock, um, then this is nothing new, but still worth mentioning. The Wi-Fi vulnerability everyone is talking about in these days or days before or weeks before even when this uh, episode comes out. Wi-Fi vulnerability in WPA2 called Crack. So, this is yes. at crackattacks.com. So the researchers say here, we discovered serious weaknesses in the WPA2, or sorry, in WPA2, a protocol that secures all modern protected Wi-Fi networks. An attacker within range of a victim, so probably about 100 meters or so, you know, Wi-Fi range, uh, can exploit these weaknesses using a key reinstallation attack, and that's where they came up with the acronym CRACK. Um, Concretely, attackers can use this novel attack technique to read information that is previously assumed to be safely encrypted. I think my understanding of the way it works is you can trick the uh, AP or the client into using a key they've already used before such that you can eventually decrypt the traffic. Or in some cases, you could actually trick them into using a key that's all zeros, which effectively doesn't encrypt the traffic. <laughs> Yeah, not very encrypted at all. 
Uh, so they say that uh, this can be abused to steal sensitive information, such as credit card numbers, passwords, chat messages, emails, photos, and so on. Although hopefully your credit card numbers, passwords, and emails go over SSL, but maybe not. Uh, the attacker, the attack works against all modern protected Wi-Fi networks. Despite uh, or depending on a network configuration, it is possible to inject and manipulate data as well. For example, an attacker might be able to inject malware or ransomware into a legitimate website. Okay, yeah, so this one is the, of the other things everyone has. One of the other things the encryption on Wi-Fi is supposed to do is prevent the packets from being modified. Uh, they say, note that if your device supports Wi-Fi, it is most likely affected. During our initial research, we discovered ourselves that Android, Linux, Apple, Windows, BSD, MediaTek, and Linksys devices, among others, are all affected by some variant of the attacks. Uh, turns out it mostly seems to be an implementation problem. Although partly probably because the spec didn't specify what should have been done in that case. Uh, but hmm. uh, for more information about specific products, consult the database of CERT, the Computer Emergency Response Team, uh, or contact your vendor. And so they have a detailed research paper if you want to learn all about it, and they have some videos and examples and details and so on. Hmm. Uh, and information about the practical attacks and uh, all the various bits for it, and then the CVE numbers that explain the four different, or the uh, various different ways that they uh, broke Wi-Fi. <laughs> yeah, in various interesting or bad ways. Yeah. Quite a bit of information. Uh, so there's uh, advisories from most of your favorite operating systems. Uh, so FreeBSD has the advisory SA17 colon 07 uh, for WPA. Uh, as of the date of this recording, which is two weeks or so before you're actually watching this, if you're not watching it live, um, the patches are only out for 11.0 and 11.1. Um, there's a workaround provided for using 10.3 and 10.4, where you basically install the newer version of WPA supplicant from ports and uh, add a line to rc.conf to make it used that version instead of the base version. Um, the reason for this is that 10.3 and 10.4 use a, a much older version of WPA Supplicant, basically what was new when uh, Stable 10 was created, uh, and the patches don't apply nicely there yet, and so that's still under construction. Um, but by the time you're watching this, when it actually comes out in November, I'm yeah. sure that'll be fixed by then. Um, it's not clear which path they will take just yet, uh, whether it will be porting the patches back to WPA Supplicant 2.0 uh, from 2013 that's in FreeBSD 10, uh, or just wholesale upgrading it to the WPA Supplicant 2.5 that's included in FreeBSD 11 uh, so that it's the new version uh, and the patches just apply that way. It's a bigger patch, but... Uh, we know it works, so that might be an option. Worth applying, yeah. Yep, uh, and there's also a RADS for NetBSD and so on. Uh, OpenBSD is a slightly special case in this case. Um, it says that OpenBSD announced an errata on August 30th. Uh, so for everyone else, the uh, this vulnerability was a coordinated disclosure for 8 a.m. Eastern time in the us uh on october 16th uh but openbsd released their patches on august 30th although they did it quietly uh to try to do this uh so there's an faq on the official site here this is why did openbsd silently release a patch before the embargo was over and they say openbsd released an errata on uh, august 30th that silently prevented our key reinstallation attack more specifically patches were released for both openbsd 6.0 and 6.1 uh, it says we notified openbsd of the vulnerability on july 15th before cert was involved uh, to do the coordination of notifying all the vendors and operating systems uh, quite quickly theater rat replied and critiqued the tentative disclosure deadline saying and in open source world, if a person writes a diff and has to sit on it for months, that's very discouraging. Note that I wrote uh, and included a suggested diff for OpenBSD already, and that at the time of the tentative disclosure deadline, uh, the deadline was going to end or, uh, around the end of August. 
Uh, as a compromise, I allowed them to silently patch the vulnerability. In hindsight, this was a bad decision since others might rediscover the vulnerability by inspecting their silent patch. To avoid this problem in the future, OpenBSD will now receive vulnerability notifications closer to the end of the embargo. But hmm. obviously OpenBSD had a reply to this as well. Uh, cool. So Stefan Sperling, who's the de facto Wi-Fi maintainer for OpenBSD, says, I first learned about this WPA problem in June. A simple patch was provided, which I could commit uh, with just slight modifications. The original embargo was already two months long and then was extended for an additional two months. The general public, being you, were left in the dark about this for the last, or uh, for at least four months. This is a very static state of affairs and takes industry much too long to apply simple patches. Uh, but then on the lobster site, he actually had a more detailed response uh, saying, uh, when they got CERT involved, and thus the US government agencies, uh, and had to extend the embargo even further until uh, Monday of uh, the October 16th. Uh, at that point, we had already had the ball rolling and decided to stick to the original uh, agreement of the embargo date of August 30th. Uh, and he gave us uh, an agreed nod towards doing that. Uh, in this situation, a request for keeping the problem and fix secret is a request to leave our users at risk and expose, uh, expose to insiders who will potentially use the bug to exploit our users. Uh, and we have no idea who the other insiders are. We have to assume that information of this kind leaks and uh, dissipates pretty fast in the security community. We chose to serve the needs of our users uh, who are vulnerable people in this drama, and we stand by that choice. Mm. That's interesting so, to see how each project uh, handles these security uh, vulnerabilities and, mm -hmm. and disclosures and, yeah. It's a mess already. Um, so yeah. at work, we use WPA for wired networking because we have to authenticate with the uh, wall outlet because it's using 802.1x mm -hmm. so that no uh, malicious person, whatever that might be, could just hook into our network and do stuff. So we have to authenticate against the, the wall socket first. But this is a, not a, something we have to... Uh, deal here. This is just Wi-Fi. Well, it's bad enough because many people are all on Wi-Fi now, and it's their main uh, network connectivity method. But yeah, it's it's what it is. It needs to be patched. People should update their systems and uh, make sure that this is um, not affecting them. Yeah, um, <clears throat> but most operating systems didn't get patches for this until four days uh, before the coordinated disclosure deadline. And that might have been partly because of the fact that OpenBSD leaked it, but it's hard to say. Uh, anyway, uh, the patches are there. Um, you can also work around it by just installing a newer WPA supplicant, which is updated in ports, and uh, Package Source has it as well. So even if you're on some other OS and they're having trouble getting the patch or whatever, you can grab it from Package Source. Uh, when we recorded this, uh, NetBSD has committed a patch to their head, uh, and it was pending pull up into the six, seven, and eight branches. Uh, I assume that might have already happened by today, uh, but by November, I'm sure that'll be done. Um, as of this recording on October 18th, it doesn't look like Dragonfly has updated their copy of WPA Supplicant yet. They're still using 2.1. Uh, which is slightly newer than what we have in FreeBSD 10, but also quite old. Uh, imported into Dragonfly in 2014. Okay. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, it's it's part of the base system, but it's something that's not part of your project because you get it from some mm -hmm. upstream source. And keeping track with those upstream sources, whether there's a security update or a general feature upgrade or whatever, it's... It takes someone to maintain, so that's why we have maintainers, not only in ports, but also yes, in well, places. I think in, in this particular case, what's interesting is the upstream only provided patches for WPA Supplicant 2.6, uh, and those had to be oh. manually backported to 2.5 to apply to FreeBSD 11, and that's why it's taking longer to get the FreeBSD 10 release out, uh, because 
um, the patches don't apply to, to a WP Supplicant 2.0. Yeah, because uh, no one thought of backporting these changes. Mm -hmm. um, and looking at it, most uh, operating systems are not running the very latest version of WPA Supplicant. And so uh, it raises the question of whether maybe WPA Supplicant should be considered as part of that core infrastructure initiative or something uh, to be staffed up to be able to provide long-term support for certain versions of it or something. Mm hmm you know, it seems to be that we have this problem where we have uh, software that has very few maintainers uh, and turns out is much more critical than we ever thought it was. You know, yeah. WPA supplicant isn't something most people think about, except for when they're yeah. cursing that config Just file works. format. That's terrible. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Yeah, this should be uh, put into the UCL. Yeah, but uh, it's an upstream project, though, so we'd have to convince those people. And then that would bring that in as dependency for all the versions of Linux that use it, too. Right, but yeah, everyone. But, you know, I'm all for infecting Linux with UCL. <laughs> that wouldn't be the worst in the world, but yeah, it's a t totally different discussion. <laughs> so, time for our news roundup this week, uh, with the first item being NetBSD at DTrace and ZFS update. So, yes, so this is a post over to the. Uh, tech kernel list at NetBSD from uh, Chuck Silvers. Who, uh, and he says, I've been working on updating NetBSD's copy of DTrace and ZFS to replace uh, from the existing ancient open Solaris versions to recent FreeBSD versions. Most of the FreeBSD changes are pretty close to what NetBSD would need, so it seems uh, like a more useful upstream for us. Uh, so kind of like how the ZF open ZFS on o uh, an OS X port is actually based on the Linux, which is a port of the Illumos one. Uh, NetBSD's DTrace and ZFS are going to be based on FreeBSD, which is based on Illumos, hmm. uh, which is cool. Um, he says, I have uh, things working well enough now that I want to share the code in preparation for committing it. So this update uh, improves upon our existing DTrace and ZFS code in several ways, uh, picks up all the upstream ZFS fixes and enhancements for the last decade, so getting all the new ZFS version numbers and features and such. Uh, also means ZFS can now support nmap, uh, sorry, mmap on uh, NetBSD, so you can actually run executables that are stored on ZFS. Uh, their implementation was missing that previously. And uh, dtrace function boundary tracing probes can now be used on kernel modules, so you can actually trace ZFS uh, with dtrace on NetBSD. So they have a patch posted up on the uh, on the NetBSD FTP site for now, uh, which uh, needs to apply using the patch dash capital E option because it adds and removes some files and so on. Uh, so he provides a bit of a summary of the diff. Uh, it's a copy of FreeBSD's DTrace and ZFS code as of uh, revision three one five nine eight three, which is from March of this year. Uh, so try to get all that forklift stuff to get done and then they can catch up from there because uh, they're already missing a couple of features that have happened since March. Mm. Yeah, it's a huge uh, work. Yeah. Yep, they uh, provide a few updates to NetBSD's copy of libproc from FreeBSD. Uh, the build system support for using the no omit frame pointer uh, everywhere uh, and disabling other compiler optimizations that confuse DTrace. Uh, a sample kernel config uh, changes to build uh, EVB ARM uh, with ZFS and so on. They provide the module KSIMS uh, to enhance integration with uh, DTrace. Uh, the GenFS API has been extended to support ZFS, so that's their generic file system API. Uh, an option to have uh, mutexes not uh, become no ops during a panic, uh, because that's required. Uh, and then UVM A object API changed to support 64 bit uh, A object size, like for tempfs and so on. And uh, then they have a list of known issues. Uh, currently, unloading the ZFS module fails even when no zpool is imported. If you've done much with ZFS since it loaded, uh, this seems to be a ref counting problem with something where it ends up getting freed, but not uh, the ref count doesn't go back down to zero. 
Uh, the module ref counting uh, for active uh, function boundary tracing probes is bogus. Currently, module ref counting is protected by the current config lock, but taking that lock down in the bowels of DTrace seems like uh, very likely to create deadlocks. So they plan to do something fancier, but haven't gotten around to it yet. Uh, the DTrace user registers stuff is uh, still wrong and not working quite. And they have the um, CTF or compact type framework or whatever, um, the type ID overflow problem. Uh, there's too many different types. I think FreeBSD even has that problem still because uh, it only supports like 32,000 types and we have more. <laughs> Uh, currently unsupported features is the .zfs virtual directory. So accessing you know .zfs slash snapshot slash foo uh, doesn't work. Um, if Chuck happens to be watching, um, af sometime after March, uh, AVG at FreeBSD rewrote that code. Uh, so you might want to target the new one rather than the old one when you try to get that working because uh, I think it's more straightforward and more the BSD way. So we'll apply nicer to NetBSD. Uh, ZVols are unsupported. Uh, ZFS ACLs or NFS v4 ACLs, uh, exporting NFS on NetBSD, setting DTrace probes, uh, using ZFS as a root file system is also not supported. Uh, and the new hashes like SHA-512, truncated, uh, Skeen, and Eden R are not supported, although FreeBSD doesn't support Eden R either. And the ZIO delay injection, which is used for testing, is not supported and they don't support D-Trace on things other than x86 and ARM. Mm -hmm. Of course, with NetBSD's uh, <coughs> wide variety of platforms, that's a, a whole different issue then. And I mean, if you would start porting ZFS now with no prior ZFS support, that's a huge amount of work because of all these features you have to integrate. When we started with ZFS, it has a bunch of features from the original ZFS code, but now what it's going to be now and you're going to the zfs developer summit soon so there's a lot more stuff coming and putting porting that all to an operating system that's a huge amount of work yes although porting it from freebsd to netbsd is probably a lot less work than porting it from solaris to netbsd oh uh, okay yeah if you want to take that route then yeah certainly worth trying out yeah it's much more likely that the code to be a little closer to the same that way or even just by diffing the Alumos and FreeBSD codes, you can see these are the places where FreeBSD had to change something. Mm -hmm. uh, and that gives you an idea where to start for doing it for NetBSD. Yeah. But potentially it would provide ZFS on an architecture that NetBSD supports, which has 64-bit support, that FreeBSD doesn't or any other ZFS supporting operating system. Yes, uh, at some point I'm sure we will hear of ZFS running on something ridiculous because of NetBSD. <laughs> My toaster just did a snapshot. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that'd be great. Um, <clears throat> so yes, uh, I'll be interested to uh, tell the people at the Open ZFS Dev Summit that another BSD is picking up ZFS. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good news. And uh, yeah, Indeed. hopefully... One day they will get um, on par, at least, with uh, the other BSDs. And then there's the, the question of importing pools between these two. Or yes, uh, in general, if you support, you know, once they support uh, V5000 of ZFS, then things are pretty portable as long as you support the same set of feature flags. Or even if, you, even if the pool is created on a newer version, as long as that new feature isn't actually used, it's still importable on an older version. So uh, ah, yeah, ZFS right. feature flags have three states. There's like disabled, where it's not supported. Uh, there's enabled, where it can be used, but hasn't been yet. And then active, meaning it's currently in use. Mm -hmm. If you destroy the last data set that was using that feature, it even goes back from active to enabled. Ah, very nice. So for example, okay. I'm working on this new Z standard compression. If you start using it, obviously your pool won't be importable on an older version. However, if you delete the only data set that was, you know, you only created a testing data set to try Z standard for a couple of minutes. Yeah. If you destroy that, the feature goes back to only being enabled and can suddenly be imported on a machine that doesn't support it yet. Mm -hmm. And the best part, ZFS send converts 
the pool back to the lowest common denominator. It does like, you know, you can send from uh, the latest, greatest version of FreeBSD with that and receive it on a FreeBSD 7 box mm. that doesn't have Which... any idea that any of that stuff exists. Yeah, so this is, uh, that's why if you want to enable some of the features like sending large blocks, sending compressed blocks, etc., you have to provide extra flags to ZFS send because by default, it turns the stream into a compatible stream that will work with any version of ZFS. Mm -hmm. Cool. And I mean, mm -hmm. just this functionality alone is something that the other file systems don't have. It's yeah. just magic. <laughs> yeah, check out the patch and um, yeah, help with porting or give feedback uh, so that NetBSD will have a good ZFS and DTrace support. So, Our next other story. big news uh, that you might have already heard by now, but if not, <laughs> here's the information. Uh, PFSense 2.4.0 has been released. Uh, yep. This is over at netgate.com, of course. And uh, mm -hmm. Jim Pingle wrote this uh, re release notes uh, article. And um, starts, of course, uh, with, we're excited to announce the release of PFSense software version 2.4, now available for new installations and upgrades. PFSense software version 2.4.0 was a Herculean effort. It is the culmination of 18 months of hard work by NetGate and community contributors with over 290 items resolved. According to Git, 671 files were changed with a total of, well, a lot 1. of lines 6. added. 1.65 million <laughs> lines added and uh, 185,000 lines deleted. Ah, that's a lot. Um, uh, but apparently yeah. a lot of the added lines are translations. Adding entire languages of all the version strings adds a lot of lines. Excellent. That will um, allow PFSense in a lot of other countries that are not necessarily um, versed in English. Okay, here are the highlights. So, FreeBSD 11.1 release as the base operating system. So, this is the latest release that um, it has uh, support for. So, this is pretty mm -hmm. much in sync. And uh, there's a new PFSense installer based on BSD install with support for ZFS, UEFI, and multiple types of partition layouts like GPT and uh, BIOS partition, which is the older one, which you shouldn't use anymore. Mm -hmm. But if you have devices like that that only support BIOS, then by all means use that. Support yeah. for NetGate so, are uh, devices. Just being able to have your PFSense system be on ZFS is a huge win. Sure, yeah. by all means. Mm-hmm. Um, there's OpenVPN 2.4.x support, which brings features like ASGCM ciphers, speed improvements, negotiable, cyper, psych, blah, blah, negotiable crypto parameters called NCP, TLS encryption, and dual-stack multi-home. Excellent. So the, for the OpenVPN people, uh, they will get a little bit more performance out of this. Yeah, of course. Uh, ARM support is definitely a big deal, though. Uh, Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Lots but, of people have wanted to... It's like, what we need is, I want to run PFSense, but I want to run this ARM device. It's like, well, you can do that now. Because it saves a lot of power over the years because <laughs> it's just continuously running and doesn't use much. Um, yes, exactly. Uh, like you mentioned, translations of the GUI into 13 different languages. And uh, for more information on contributing to the translation effort, read the previous blog post they had and visit the project on Zanata. So there's a link there. Uh, web GUI improvements are also in there, so, uh, such as a new login page, improved get post CR, CSRF handling, and significant improvements to the dashboard and its AJAX handling. Mm -hmm. So very nice. So you get some little eye candy as well. Um, a certificate management improvement was also done, including CSR signing and international character support. Captive Portal has been rewritten to work without multiple instances of IPFW. Nice. Oh. And the most important uh, information, yeah. I was uh, going to mention they also have uh, some of the other benefits they got from upgrading to FreeBSD 11.1, which happened kind of late, uh, is the security enhancements for the stack clash vulnerability, uh, new and updated drivers for various hardware, updated wireless stack, etc. cetera, uh, the improved IPsec kernel implementation, uh, and Hyper-V support. Oh, mm -hmm. and the elastic network adapter support for Amazon as well. Oh, wow, there's a lot of stuff in there, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and there's an important information attached to the release notes. 32-bit x86 and nano BSD have been deprecated and are not supported on PFSense 2.4. So they cut at this point and will not support any future 32-bit x86 yeah. platforms. So if you have hardware capable of running 64-bit images, you should reinstall with the 64-bit version of PFSense. Uh, 32-bit x86 hardware can continue to run PFSense version 2.3.x, uh, which they guarantee will continue to receive security updates for at least a year after the release of 2.4, which was uh, October 12th. Um, Nano BSD installs on 64-bit hardware uh, must be changed uh, to run a full installation. This can be accomplished by reinstalling or following this manual upgrade process they have uh, uh, a link to here that can let you convert a nano BSD to a full install so you can replace it with ZFS or mm -hmm. UFS. I guess ZFS is not required. Uh, and then it says to use ZFS, a reinstall of the operating system is required. It is not possible to upgrade in place from UFS to ZFS, as you might yeah, guess. Yeah. <laughs> That's uh, a given. Uh, there are also instructions about how to upgrade to PFSense via the GUI. And of course, upgrading from older releases is also mentioned and uh, as well as reporting issues and other stuff where you can get the actual release and supporting the project. Yep, they also have uh, upgrade instructions here for upgrading from 2.3 and 2.2 and earlier and, and so on. And links for the downloads and all the good stuff. Mm -hmm. So, do you suddenly find yourself in need of uh, some new 64-bit hardware to run your router on? <laughs> Yeah, you just in case. You should probably get in touch with our friends at iX Systems. Go to ixsystems.com slash BSD now. So when I needed a router, uh, what I wanted was something small. I wanted It needed to be rack mountable because I have a rack, but I didn't want something big, and I wanted something kind of quiet. So I got this short depth 1U uh, machine. With, with, a, with IPMI, the fans can be turned down really quiet. So it's a, a low-voltage E3 processor, so two cores plus hyper-threading, but doesn't use a lot of power. Uh, the box is short depth, so it's only about you know, this deep. It uh, doesn't have hot swap bays or anything like that. Uh, and it's got four onboard one gig Intel NICs. Uh, so it makes a very nice firewall. Hmm. And this is exactly what you would um, tell the uh, people that you call that you have on the phone if you call iX systems tell them what the system should do in the future that you're what the intended purpose for the system is and they will tell you exactly what kind of solution they would build for you and what kind of components they would put in or which components work better together or um, which you shouldn't use and this is exactly what you want to have from a vendor that doesn't that is taking care of you know what the customer wants and solving the problem and not just selling, you know, off-the-shelf standard servers they have. Um, and this is this is just iX Systems. The way they have the customers uh, describe the problem and then figuring out what's the best system for them is just the way you want to have. Yeah, and I I know I probably said it last week, but the white glove support uh, during the sales process and the post-sales process are so worth it. So. Those 10 machines I bought, to the video transcoding appliances for my business, they're shipping uh, this week, which is October 18th or whatever. Um, so they're going to arrive at the data centers early next week. It's uh, 10 different locations they're going to. And I am going to be away from home at the OpenZFS Developer Summit. Far, far and away. <laughs> If, if it was some other vendor, I would be very worried right now that something wasn't going to go quite right and that it's gonna, not going to be able to deal with it quickly enough because I'm away from home and so on. But because it's IX, they're going to take care of everything and I'm going to arrive home and it's like, oh, all 10 of your new servers are online and everything works perfectly. Yeah. Or if you want a price tag on that much peace of mind. <laughs> <laughs> Or if you want something smaller than that, like for your home or office use, then check out the FreeNAS Minis or the Mini mm -hmm. XL there stuff for all your backup needs. So, 
So next up, we have OpenBSD changes of note. Uh, yes, this is uh, from our uh, always uh, heavily posting um, good stuff, Ted, Ted Unangst. Mm -hmm. And he writes that there is some cool stuff happening in OpenBSD, of course, because uh, the use get R usage to measure the CPU time in MD5 benchmarking. So yeah, that's so, um, uh, <clears throat> more accurate measuring of the benchmark there. They added uh, support for isochronous mode uh, for XHCI. So that's uh, faster transfers for USB 3. It's disabled by default. Well, it's still in testing, but it's available there if you want to play with it. Uh, this is some of the 386 implementations of math functions in compiler RT use SSE2 and have been switched to using generic C code instead. Um, interesting one is they added guard pages to the end of the kernel stacks, so overflows don't run into important stuff. Um, that might be interesting for FreeBSD, uh, even not necessarily just to keep stuff from getting overwritten, but just to detect the case afterwards. Um, when I was working on the initial Z standard patches uh, for ZFS, uh, I was unknowingly overflowing the stack um, because Z standard back in the early versions, like 0 0.7 and so on, uh, used a lot of stack variables uh, before it got a heap mode to deal with that. Um, and it would overflow the stack and you would get these weird crashes where like it would crash three times in a row and not one of them would be in the same function and so on because it was just clobbering the stack and writing into other frames and so on. Uh, so yes, that'd be cool to have FreeBSD. Yep. They oh. added a new Ethernet driver, DWXE, which is the Ethernet found on the all-winner A64, H3, and H5 SOCs. So that's a number of different uh, devices, I think. That includes some of the Rock 64 stuff, maybe? A bunch of different uh, ARM devices, anyway. Uh, they fixed the buffer overflow in their Perl regular expressions, uh, fixed the regression caused by the removal of uh, SIGIO uh, and some devices. Um, their Malik implementation now always delays freeing chunks and changes the capital F option to uh, perform a more extensive check for double freeze. Uh, they changed the send syslog prototype. Uh, that's their new uh, libc API for syslog uh, to take a string since there's little point sending or a uh, little point in logging not strings <laughs> and then uh, interesting one they had was the config program which uh, builds their kernel config um, tries to modify zero initialized variables uh, previous versions of GCC had been patched uh, to place these variables in the data segment instead of the BSS but Clang has no such patches. Long, long ago, that was the default behavior of GCC, and that's why their GCC had been modified to keep doing it that way. Uh, but now we have a slightly less unusual tool chain, uh, so they fixed the underlying issue by adding some annotations to the variable to make sure they go to the right section. Okay. Oh, they also closed the default syslog D port 514. Yep. So, very nice. So one less open port where stuff is listening on. Yep. Next. Uh, yep. Uh, while we're already on the subject of OpenBSD, we still get reports from the T two K seventeen hackathon. Uh, this one is from Philip Günther about locking and libc. Uh, he writes, um, "I showed up to T two K seventeen with a couple holdover diffs from E two K seventeen." that weren't uh, stable then and hadn't gotten to um, any better since. So after a red eye through Chicago, uh, he arrived in the hack room, fired up his laptop and synced trees. Meanwhile, people trickled in and the best part of hackathons, the conversations and what do you think about this? Chats started. Theo introduced me to Todd Mortimer, which is uh, Mortimer at openbsd.com, uh, .org, .com, uh, who's been hacking on Clang to implement RedGuard for C programs. Over the hackathon, they discussed a few loose ends that cropped up and what the current behavior should be for them all as the, uh, as the mechanics of avoiding uh, OXC3 bytes, the return opcode, embedded in the middle of other multibyte x86 machine code. Fun stuff. Martin, which is MPI at openbsd.org, uh, and he had a conversation about the desirability of being able to sleep while holding netlock and pretty much came down on, oof, the scheduler does not does need work before the underlying issue driving this question can be resolved enough to answer it. Mm, well, more work needed. 
Uh, after some final hammering, I got an enhancement to pool to let a pool use sleeping RW locks instead of spinning mutexes, then immediately use that for pure CPU pool cache pool as well as the futex pool. Further pools are likely to be converted as well uh, as kernel upper level locking changes are made. Uh, speaking of, a larger diff I had been working on for set upper level locking was still suffering deadlock issues so that I took a stab at narrowing it down to just a lock for the process tree. Uh, mostly mirroring the FreeBSD proc tree underscore lock. That appears to be holding up much better, and I just have some code arrangement issues around sys underscore ptrace before that'll go out for final review. Then, most of the way through the week, Bob Beck vocally complained that life would be easier for LibreSSL if we had some version of ptread underscore once and the ptread mutex routines in libc. This would make some other stuff easier too, uh, like some the ptread stops, for example. And the TIB work over the last couple of years has basically eliminated the runtime cost of doing so. So uh, Philip spent the rest of the hackathon finding the right place to draw the line through pit, lip, three, p, well, lip p thread and move everything on the one side of the line into lip c. That code seems pretty stable and the Xenocara ports, people seem to like it. Or at least accept the effects uh, of it so that it almost certainly will be in the next lip c bump. Uh, lots of other random conversations, hacking, meals, and beer. Uh, many thanks to Ken Westerback and local conspirators for another excellent Toronto hackathon. Very nice. Uh, so it seems like there's some more locking coming in OpenBSD. So, time for our Beastie Bits this week. Uh, the first item we have this uh, week is the 2017 NetBeastie Foundation Officers list. So this is over at the uh, blog netbsd.org. And uh, by vote of the NetBSD Foundation Board of Directors, the officers for the 2017 uh, term are, well, the president will be William J. Coldwell. The vice president is Jeremy C. Reed. Uh, secretary and treasurer is Christos Zulas. Uh, the assistant secretary is Thomas Klausner. And the assistant treasurer is Taylor R. Campbell. So in case you want to contact them, then you know who... Who is who, basically. Next item is uh, a new BSD mag is out uh, with the title story, Military Grade Data Wiping in FreeBSD with BC Wipe. Uh, they have some other stuff in there, like uh, an article about the Hammer file system, volume management, and pseudo. Uh, file system mm -hmm. mirroring Dragonfly BSD, advanced Unix queuing techniques, and OpenBSD from a veteran Linux user perspective. Yes, some interesting different stuff over there. Uh, yep. And uh, last item for this week is Liberty BSD 6.1 release. So in case you haven't heard about this, here's a little description from the website. OpenBSD is universally known as an operating system designed with security in mind, proudly being able to say that it has had only two remote holds in the default install in a hack of a lot of time. Uh, hang a long time, actually. So, however, OpenBSD ships with several pieces of non-free, binary-only firmware in the base system, and depending on the hardware detected, by default, a script will download more at first boot without informing the user about this. With a default installation, you might end up using some of this non-free firmware without ever knowing about it. And if you try to install additional software, you might end up unwittingly installing non-free programs. Liberty BSD, which is this one about, um, is a D-Blob version of OpenBSD. You can get all of the benefits of OpenBSD while being sure that there is nothing non-free lurking in the depths of your system. Uh, so if you're one of those GPL conspirator type people that's all worried about the firmware blobs, then this is for you. This is your BSD then, yeah. <laughs> Yes. Ah, this week's episode of BSD Now is brought to you by Tarstamp. Online backups for the truly paranoid. Did you do a backup this week? Well, we're waiting. You mean this uh, week? If you mean today, right? Yeah, today. Yeah, this hour today. actually. This mm -hmm. this very second. Yes, that's <laughs> a very important thing and nice to have. A uh, thing about Tarstamp is because it does uh, segmentation, deduplication, and compression before it does the encryption for your backup, doing your backups very frequently doesn't cost you anything extra. It only You only pay to store the, the compressed versions of the blocks that you actually upload. And so all the compression is gained on your side, not their side. 
yes, that's this is the place where you should encrypt your stuff before you put it into the cloud. So no one is able to decrypt it there or get your files in plain text. So you're the only person holding the decryption keys and that's how it's supposed to be. And it's if the you know only it, way you can trust the cloud is if it's encrypted by you with a key only you have before it goes to the cloud because the only way you can guarantee it can be rendered useless in the cloud is by destroying that key that only you have. Yeah, and then no one is able to decrypt it again. Yeah. And if you otherwise, know how to use... Otherwise, there's some way that they can, uh, you know, get access to your files, and you really don't want that. And so Tarsnap is the best way to prevent that, and the source code for the client is available for you to inspect and to mm -hmm. build yourself if you want as well. Yeah, this is exactly um, the way um, the people... So some of these backup solutions, they kind of keep you in the dark how it's going to work or how it's going to be encrypted, what kind of keys they're using. But TarSnap is pretty open about it. And if you know how to use TAR on any Unix system, then you can already know or use most of the systems or the, the TarSnap sub-commands that TarSnap provides. You know, if, if the backup service claims that it uses military-grade encryption and that they're just going to do it for you, it probably means they encrypt everything with one key, which means they can decrypt it. Whereas yeah. TarSnap, you encrypt it with your key on your computer and never give them the key, so there's no way they can even look at your files. Hmm. And it, you just have to chart up your account with uh, less than $5 per month, and that's how you get started. And it's a small amount for a lot of um, sleeping well at night knowing that your backups is secure and no one else uh, except you can decrypt that. All right, uh, our feedback section has been getting smaller and smaller and people should really, really, really send us more feedback at feedback at bsdnow.tv. Um, whatever bugs you, whatever is unclear, or if you have a problem, then send it to us and we'll try to cover it in a future episode. But this week we have a question from Eddie about the EuroBSDCon 2017 video and uh, some help. Uh, he writes... I'm Eddie, a Linux user for more than 15 years, software engineer with experience with embedded systems for about the same time. I've been listening to the BSD Now show for at least the last two years while searching for some door to try BSD. Uh, recently, I became a dad, oh, congratulations, uh, so free time for experimenting with BSD is very low. I think also uh, he has a, oh, yeah. I think also very short attention span, uh, which doesn't help either. So when I saw you provided links to the videos from EuroBSDCon 2017, I was glad. Uh, I know you're not the responsible people for the videos for EuroBSDCon, but I don't know. How, but he doesn't know how to contact. Okay, so here goes. I was planning to watch some of the EuroBSDCon 2017 videos you linked to in the episode 2013, uh, but I have seen today they are no longer available. I know that at least some of them were available when you published the episode. Did you know what happened? Will they be restored? Uh, so I guess when we linked originally, those were the live recordings. They've been publishing the edited versions. So probably in the same account or at the EuroBSDCon account. Uh, we'll collect the links uh, for the new versions and get them put together in a future episode for you uh, so they can be cataloged. But I think it was... We kind of just jumped the gun and gave you the links to the, it was like live streams of the entire day. And we just timestamped linked into those videos. And I think they've replaced those with edited versions uh, with the sponsor bumps and so on. Uh, and so we just need to update the links and uh, yeah, we'll they get that done. Yeah, they had a recording crew there. So they will make sure that you have much better resolution and better audio quality. Uh, it just takes a little while to put this together. Um, yeah, so in his, in his view, the availability of presentations and recordings about BSD can help a lot in bringing new people and ideas to the BSDs. Yes, especially for those people who couldn't make the conference or had to see that specific talk, but there was another interesting talk in a parallel track. So, yeah, this is a good way. Is there a canonical place of links to the videos from the various BSD conferences? Um, not really. I know that I think Hiroki controls the BSD conferences YouTube account, but the videos tend to end up kind of all over the place. Generally, the conference's official website will have links to the videos at some point. Uh, but I've also been working on a website. It's not anywhere near ready yet, but papers.freebsd.org that will have all the FreeBSD presentations from any conference and links to the slides and videos and papers if they exist. Um, 
and I'm working on getting that put together to make this easier. Yeah, so, uh, or just Google at a certain conference or go to the conference website, there might be some uh, links there. Um, yeah, uh, there's the second part of his email is about uh, his efforts to try to use BSD. Uh, since he writes, I own two Pine 64 plus boards, but I'm not yet ready to dive into BSD 100%. I tried first using NetBSD, but uh, ARCH64 support is still not published in NetBSD. Recently, I tried transplanting in the ARCH64 support from FreeBSD into NetBSD, but stopped. Now I'm trying to add cross-build uh, support for FreeBSD from Linux. Uh, there's a code link to a GitHub repository, uh, but I think I need some help and guidance since I'm an unfamiliar with the FreeBSD build system and the way things are deployed from source to the final root of S layout. Uh, currently, uh, yeah. I know there's some other people working on making FreeBSD compile on Linux who might be able to get you in touch with them. I would say that's a rather ambitious project. Right, yeah, but if you, you know, find people that are uh, with similar interests, yeah, why not? So currently, he writes, I'm particularly interested in materials regarding cross-building from Linux uh, because he's the person behind the efforts related to NetBSD and Linux's NL, NSLU2 presented in the episode 89. Ah, you'll see there's a nice uh, feedback here. I know there is an idea regarding cross-building the FreeBSD from Linux on the FreeBSD wiki, and there's a link here to the FreeBSD wiki page, which links uh, Brooks Davis as contact, uh, but he couldn't find any contact info. Uh, well, this is actually quite easy. So Brooks Davis can be reached in, well, he has a bunch of um, channels. He's in the uh, BSD Dev channel and on FNet. He's on other channels. And he also publishes a couple of paper or did so in the, in the past years, which should have his email address. I think it's, cool. isn't it Brooks at freebsd.org? That's yeah, just Google, to Google his name, there should be something coming up. Okay, thank you, Eddie, for this um, question, you know, feedback section. Uh, the next one is from Eric about ZFS monitoring. Oh, this is for Alan. Well, mm -hmm. not just for him, but yeah, many other people. Uh, it was also Mark Felder, I think. Ah, okay. Ah, that's the, yeah, okay. Okay, so here is his message. Um, I've been a listener for quite a while and even had a tool mentioned on an episode a while ago, which is episode 183. Uh, the ETH name tool, uh, which was fun to hear. See, something will appear on the show eventually. Yep. <laughs> At first, uh, I thought my Google foo was uh, missing a tool someone else had already created, but then realized you were describing mine. <laughs> See? <laughs> yes, I, his first reaction when he heard the name of his tool, I was like, what, somebody made another tool with the same name as mine? I was like, nope, <laughs> we're talking about your work. <laughs> yeah, so if you have done anything in open source world, the chances are that it's going to end up on the show if it's a good thing and if people are using it. So, unrelated to that, in your last episode, you put out a request for how people monitor their ZFS installations. I'll throw my hat into that ring. I use Zabbix extensively for monitoring ZFS and the pool status. I like Zabbix for its extensibility, cross-platform nature, and reporting capabilities. For the record, I have no relationship with Zabbix beyond the user. So, explicitly, I use Zabbix's discovery functionality to enable the automatic detection and monitoring of the tools, uh, of the pools, of course, and ZFS file systems on both FreeBSD and ZFS on Linux, as well as the ARC stats. Once properly configured, it can automatically generate or uh, detect the presence of and configure logging for the pool utilization and status, as well as file system snapshots and reference usage. Although any ZFS pool get uh, star property is trivial to monitor at this point. Mm -hmm. So triggers can be set up to email or notify in some other fashion when a pool status is not online or snapshot usage is over some percent relative to reference for a file system. And um, oh, this is a sign that I may want to reconfigure snapshot retention for a file system. Um, <laughs> So he also writes, with its forecasting features, I can have Zabbix warn me when a pool is going to reach some thresholds of capacity at some time in the future based on recent trends. Yeah, buy another disk and do the replacing thing. Uh, <laughs> just thought I'd pass that along. If there's interest, I could look into with his employer, start sharing the config scripts, but they are essentially a ZFS spin on the Zabbix example discovery scripts. And Zabbix is a bit of a beast to stand up, but once you've wrapped your head around how it works to do things, it works great. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, this is. Yeah, um, uh, yeah. I don't know if I have time to play with Zavix uh, for that journal article. I have to finish before you see this. <laughs> yeah. Oh, by the way, I have another request for another journal article. But yeah, <laughs> you're becoming a regular author in the FreeBSD journal now. So we yeah, probably have I'm, I'm a little behind on this one, so I don't know about doing another one right away. Although <laughs> the next due date won't be in the middle of traveling. So yeah, so, but it's we'll the, the, the it stuff. The stuff you write is is, um, is always interesting and well worth reading. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, last question. Yeah, last question is from Tom about BSD hosting. Uh, he writes, "Hello, Alan and Benedict. Thank you for steady streams of BSD goodness. Oh, our pleasure. In mm -hmm. the near future, I plan to deploy two HP microservers as offsite backup um, for his private FreeNAS and backup servers. So my plan is to persuade a family member and a friend to host one of them each on their networks." And use FreeNAS for easy administration and many offer and maybe offer them access to some services. So from his viewpoint, the NAS servers uh, will be on hostile networks, uh, as he doesn't control the networks and the users are not as security conscious as he is. Uh, will it be necessary to harden FreeNAS, or do you think I should set up my own FreeBSD servers from scratch? What's the pro and con for both scenarios? I'd say in general. Uh as long as the FreeNAS isn't directly exposed to the internet, it should be okay. Uh, it shouldn't require much hardening. You know, you can, you could decide on the FreeNAS to just switch off all the services, except for maybe SSH, right? If you're not exposing any services to your family or whatever, then you don't even need to be running Samba or NFS or FTP or anything. Uh, all you need is SSH for the replication or whatever. Uh, and then so the machine isn't exposing anything and so it's already locked down. Yeah. Or you always, if you use SSH, of course, you want to just use SSH with keys and not with, um, you know, keyboard interactive login. Sure. Right. Um, on, like, not trusting networks uh, from other people, that's a good precaution. Um, well, there's always um, TLS encryption and other ways to encrypt, or you can use a VPN between those. But depending on how much effort it is, it's probably not worth doing it. But it's certainly good to have this viewpoint of, oh, what could go wrong? This is a network I'm not controlling. Other people might, um, especially when it's parents, depending on how uh, IT uh, knowledgeable they are, there might be some people coming over and saying, oh, what do you have there? And let me just use your Wi-Fi. And then it exposes some of your NAS to it. It's, it's good asking these questions, but uh, don't overdo it if it's just um, in a in a private environment and it's hosting not that big of a uh, file base. But certainly, if you want to do it, then go for it. And the FreeNAS have um, all the hooks in place to, to do this. Uh, just don't over-configure things and make things worse with maintenance because if there's an upgrade, then you also need to look out for that other these other two networks and things like that. So this could be a, become a, a nightmare if you really want to be um, super security paranoid about this. But some basic security is certainly um, not a bad thing to do. Yeah, so this is basically what we have this week. Um, mm -hmm. Again, send questions, comments, show notes, ideas, topics, or stories you've found or written yourself to feedback at bsdnauto.tv and we'll cover it in a future episode. Yes, uh, you know, don't be discouraged if we don't cover it next week because we're recording next week's episode, well, now, uh, when we recorded this back in the middle of October <laughs> and it'll come out uh, in the second week of November. Uh, but, you know, when we come back from all of that, we're going to need <laughs> quite a bit of content. So uh, we thank you for writing in and uh, hope you'll do some more. You know, we do the show for you, so, you know, if we know what your questions are, we can answer them better. Yeah. Whatever it is, big or small problems or just feedback, it's all, all is welcome. Yeah, thanks for watching and see you next week.